This is KGW News at 4. First at four, we begin with new information about a terrible crash last night in Northeast Salem. Police now say three teenagers were killed in this crash when a drunk driver ran a red light. The crash happened at the intersection of Salem Parkway and Cherry Avenue Northeast. KGW's Catherine Cook is live at Salem Police Headquarters now with more on what happened. Catherine. Well, Chris, first of all, we cannot adequately express the grief that these victims' families are likely feeling right now, but we can share how police say this crash likely happened. They say it starts with this. None of the victims were doing anything wrong. They were just driving along when they were hit. This is who police say hit them. He is described as 25-year-old Juan Carlos Rodriguez Palacios. Police say his blood alcohol level was nearly three times the legal limit. Police responded to the crash around 11.30 last night. Investigators say Rodriguez Palacios was speeding in a Jeep Wrangler when he ran a red light at Cherry Avenue in Salem Parkway. He hit a Toyota Camry, killing all three teenagers inside. The victims are 19-year-old Trinity Watt, 19-year-old Madison Capobianco, both from Salem, and 18-year-old Michaela Tryon of Kaiser. Police say Rodriguez Palacios stayed at the scene and was treated at a local hospital, then released. At that point, he was arrested and faces multiple charges, including three counts of manslaughter in the first degree. He'll be in court tomorrow. Back to you. Catherine, as you say, so tough for those families. Thanks for the update. Well, there are calls for Oregon to get tougher on hate crimes. Under the current law, if someone commits a hate crime alone, the most they can be charged with is a misdemeanor. KGW's Lindsay Nadrich spoke with several people who say this is just unacceptable. Lindsay? This issue really became clear after a black teen was intentionally run down by a man who was part of a white supremacist prison gang. He was convicted of murder and a hate crime, but his punishment for the hate crime part was less than many say it should have been because of Oregon's laws. Under Oregon's current law, two people have to be involved in a hate crime for it to be considered a felony. That means if a hate crime is committed by only one person, the most they can be charged with now is a misdemeanor. For many, this is unacceptable. We need to make sure that people being who, who commit hate crimes and hate incidents know that there is a consequences of their actions. Casey Jama is the executive director of Unite Oregon. He says he's seen hate crimes and hate incidents increase over the years, even at his own office. They have to lock the doors during business hours because people were harassing and threatening employees because of their work on racial and social justice issues. Casey says the laws need to reflect the views of the community and show Oregon will not stand for hate. We have to send out message in our community that we no longer we, we cannot tolerate hate crimes and we cannot tolerate hate incidents. Senator Lou Frederick is one of the sponsors of Senate Bill 577. That would change the laws. He says the current law was written the way it is because of what was going on at the time. It came into effect when we were dealing with a number of gangs who were doing things, running around, not individuals so much. The 1988 murder of Mulagata Sarah, a 28-year-old college student from Ethiopia by a group of white supremacists, was an example of why the law was needed. But fast forward to 2016, when 19-year-old Larnell Bruce Jr. was intentionally run down by a man who was a member of a white supremacist prison gang. Larnell's parents still mourn his death. It's hard to talk about it. It's tough. We miss him a great deal. I think about him every day, you know. Um, it doesn't get any easier. No. Larnell's case shows a need for change. Russell Courtier, the man convicted of his murder, got life in prison for that charge. But the laws kept him from getting a harsher sentence for the hate crime charge. Senate Bill 577 would change that. It would also establish a hate crimes hotline for victims to call and would change how hate crimes are reported and tracked. The bill is currently in front of the Joint Committee on Ways and Means. Several legislators tell me it is now moving forward after some doubts. I'm told that's thanks to in part all the attention it received in the last week. Several groups wrote letters urging for this to be passed, which showed just how important this change is to Oregon. Back to you. Lindsay Nadrich live for us. Thank you, Lindsay. Tomorrow marks nine years since Kyron Horman disappeared. The second grader was last seen at Skyland School in Northwest Portland. 
KGW's Kyle LaBosch has been covering this story for the past nine years, and he's here now with a look back at this case. Kyle? Well, the missing boy's mother, Desiree Young, tells me this is a very active investigation. There have been recent searches and new evidence, but still no sign of the missing boy. The search for Kyron Horman started on June 4, 2010. The second grader was last seen at Skyline School in northwest Portland. His stepmother snapped this photo of Kyron standing in front of his project at the school's science fair. When the seven-year-old didn't arrive home later that afternoon, a phone message went out to parents around Portland. Skyline second grader Kyron Harmon did not arrive home from school today. For days, the FBI and local police coordinated what would be one of the largest search efforts in state history, with more than 1,300 people looking for the little boy. Publicly, his blended family would stand united, pleading for help. But privately, they started to doubt one of their own. Kyron's stepmother, Terry Horman, would later confirm she had failed lie detector tests. And in mid-June, police passed out a questionnaire asking if people had seen Terry Horman or the family's white truck the day her stepson disappeared. Then, a bombshell. Kane Horman, Kyron's dad, abruptly filed for divorce and later revealed that police had shared information that made him believe Terry Horman was not only involved in Kyron's disappearance, but she'd also tried to hire a man to kill her estranged husband. Terry Horman hired a defense lawyer and moved to Roseburg. Court papers from the divorce later revealed Terry Horman had been sexting with another man shortly after Kyron disappeared. As July became August, a grand jury started hearing sworn testimony from Terry Horman's friends. No charges were filed. Then, in August 2012, two years after the boy's disappearance, Kyron's biological mother filed a civil lawsuit against Terry Horman. The civil suit was later dropped. In 2014, a judge denied Terry Horman's request to change her name, citing the ongoing criminal investigation. Terry Horman moved to California and has appeared on national television and in magazines to declare her innocence. Over the years, police have conducted searches and released age progression images of the missing boy. But Kyron Horman has never been found. Terry Horman could not be reached for comment. The Multnomah County Sheriff's Office said, quote, the investigation is continuing, end quote. Tomorrow, we'll have an interview with Kyron's mother, Desiree Young, starting at 6 a.m. She has some very interesting things to add to the investigation. Back to you. Mm. Kyle, thank you. Let's take you now to Newport on a Monday afternoon where, boy, all those shades of blue coming together for a glorious picture. That's postcardish, isn't it? Beautiful. Chief Meteorologist Matt Safino joining us now. And Matt, things are going to cool down a little later in the week. And they already have a little bit. We were in the 80s over the weekend. Right now, we're only 72 in Portland, 75 in Sherwood, 72 in Hillsborough. But the clear sky continues. It is beautiful out there. We've got some clouds impinging upon the north coast, but really not a big deal at this time. We've got rain in the forecast. So for the first time in what seems like weeks, it doesn't last for weeks, it lasts for a few days. We'll let you know when that arrives and how serious the threat will be in just a bit. Back to you. Matt, thank you. Certainly a disappointing weekend for Beaver baseball fans, but this Monday, a big day for all Beaver fans. The MLB draft got underway just a few minutes ago, and catcher Adley Rutschman is expected to be the top pick this year. Rutschman was a star at Sherwood High School before heading to Corvallis for college. He's so good, one analyst says he's among the top 10 prospects since the late 80s. Others on that list include Alex Rodriguez and Ken Griffey Jr. The Orioles do have the first pick in today's draft, and our own Art Edwards is in Corvallis waiting for that big moment. We hope to hear from him coming up at 430. Well, tomorrow, a federal lawsuit that has much of the nation watching will get a pivotal day in court, and it's happening here in Portland. The issue is climate change. KGW's Pat Doris is here now with a look at what's at stake, Pat. Well, Chris, 21 young people have sued the federal government, arguing that their constitutional rights are being violated by global warming. They want a judge to order the government to crack down on fossil fuels immediately. For its part, the government wants the case dismissed. Many of the young people taking on the government are in Portland for the court case. Part of the role of being an active citizen in a democracy is that you have to be willing to step up when the government won't protect your rights. Nathan Baring is from Alaska. He's one of the plaintiffs and first got involved in environmental issues six years ago when he was 13. I think it makes our case a lot more compelling when it's young people that really haven't had a, such a, a monetary role 
or a political role in our society yet are already willing to step up to the plate um, to do this. The lawsuit accuses the government of violating the plaintiff's fundamental rights to life, liberty, and property by contributing to global warming. So tomorrow, in Portland, a three-judge panel from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals will hear arguments from both the government and the lawyers for the young plaintiffs. This is not the opening of the trial, but very important motions that could decide whether the lawsuit lives or dies. The government wants the appeals court to overturn two sets of losses. They've tried to get the case dismissed twice and lost, and they asked the judge to rule them an outright winner and lost. On the other side, the lawyer for the plaintiffs wants action in a case that's already taken four and a half years. She will ask the judges to immediately order the government to stop issuing leases and mining permits for coal on federal public lands, to stop issuing leases for offshore oil and gas exploration and extraction, and to stop all federal approval for new fossil fuel infrastructure. Even though the Court of Appeals will hear the arguments tomorrow here in Portland, it could take months before they issue a decision. The arguments will be held at 2 o'clock at Portland's federal courthouse. It's going to be streamed live. The judges have allowed that video feed to come out, and so we will carry that as well. You could find it at KGW.com. Back to you. Pat, thank you. Coming up here, the Navy practices for a natural disaster off the Oregon coast. What they launched into the water today that could help after earthquakes or tsunamis. And he was badly injured in a car accident years ago. Now his family is doing something special to help others who have gone through the same thing.